I'll go ahead and get us started. So, um, hi, I'm Etta Nahapetian, um, Economic Initiatives Coordinator and Fairfax County's Department of Economic Initiatives. And our other presenters here today will be Ben Rogers, Director of Policy and Compliance at Fairfax County Department of Housing and Community Development, and Nina Genopal, President and Chief Executive Officer of APA. So our, um, our agenda for today, uh, we're going to go over and um, talk about the importance of housing affordability, give you guys all a background um, uh, on how, why the role of affordable housing in the economy. We wanted to give everybody kind of a, ground, a lay grounding um, for affordable housing because we anticipate that there'll be folks coming to the challenge that some people that have registered are, are experts in affordable housing, um, but we're hoping that we've attracted some folks that aren't as familiar with the topic, um, but have a passion for it, and um, we're hoping this can be a helpful tool to give everyone a little bit of background. It's a very complicated topic, um, it, and hopefully this will help give everybody some grounding on what it's all about. Um, so that's the goal for the, uh, our today, is to kind of give everybody a background, understanding uh, about affordable housing, and also to do some grounding on the rules for the event, and um, it is a competition and there will be judges and there will be prizes and we're hoping to have a spirited com competition. Um, and so we're, so we're hoping that you're all looking forward to it as well. So um, again, our agenda is to do this 101 on affordable housing um, and also to just take a look at um, what, what's in the toolbox, what are the different levers that we can push to impact affordable housing and to give, you guys have a, to give you guys a chance to have any questions, answers about the material presented, but also about the challenge itself. So, uh, so the, our, our, I'll, I'll introduce um, quickly our two speakers. Uh, first, I'll ask Van Rogers to quick, say a quick hello. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here today. Ben is our Director of Policy and Compliance at Housing and Community Development. Um, the, 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 housing and, the, well, the Housing and Community Development um, Authority, Fairfax County, is the preeminent pro provider of affordable housing in Fairfax and serves as the county's local finance agency. And the staff at HCD acts as a staff to the FCRHA. So um, their, their, their responsibilities include the financing and development, rental assistance, and the development of affordable housing communities here in Fairfax. Um, they are providing, uh, the, the HCD partners with um, nonprofits in, in the area to provide services. They provide rental support. They partner with nonprofits to provide services to folks with special needs. They help people, um, Become homeowners, so they, they uh, so they they have a lot of really important uh, kind of roles in the, in the county. Uh, they they're the folks that they're helping at this point. They, they've got over twenty thousand people that they're supporting in the community. Um, their programs um, average folks in the, in the income of around twenty six thousand dollars, and um, they have approximately thirty five percent of all households served include a person with a disability and 60% of homeless households placed in long-term affordable housing are served by um, FCRHA resources. Um, so I, I will also introduce Nina Genopal. Nina, please say hello. Good morning, happy to be here. Thank you so much, Nina, for joining us. Uh, Nina is President and CEO of the Arlington Partnership for Affordable Housing. APA has, um, has developed and owns over 1,800 rental homes and 17 properties. We've 800 units in development, and um, they are in a, in an award-winning organization that until recently was primarily operating in Arlington, and they have been expanding their footprint into the rest of um, the, the, the area, and we're very, very glad to have them doing, part, doing, part, doing projects in Fairfax, in addition to Loudoun and Montgomery counties. Um, so a couple of highlights from their project, they, they have a real track record of doing some innovative um, projects in the area. The Columbia, Columbia Hills project um, is, uh, has a very creative financing options there. The, there was a first hybrid 4%, 9% financing um, for low-income housing credits for the, 
for a new construction, for a new project, construction project that was project. designed with hybrid. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And um, their project, the, the Springs, um, is a great example of um, leveraging density, taking a kind of an older garden apartment and creating a much more dense uh, project, which is a which is a great tool for us if uh, if we can over overdo the regulatory impact that we need to make that happen. Um, the Arlington Mills is a great example of. Um, of a project that is adjacent to a community center, which has preschool programs and educational programs, um, and, and uh, so that's a that's a great model as well. So um, I will talk briefly about the importance of housing affordability, um, as and as I as and we will delve deeper into this. But basically, um, housing is. Um, an underpinning and a platform for everything that we do in Fairfax, um, whether it's to, to serve as support for individual and family well-being. Um, for kids to be able to succeed, they need to have stable housing and uh, physical and mental health and well-being and economic self-sufficiency. These are all important pieces um, for, uh, for, for individual and family well-being. Um, housing, housing is the basis also for inclusive and diverse communities. Um, communities in which everybody can prosper. Um, and we need housing that allows individuals with disabilities and older adults to remain in the community of their choice. Housing supports also is key for, for sustaining local economic growth. We need folks that can live and work near where their jobs are. Um, it not only has impact for allow people to kind of stay in their jobs, but um, to drastically reduce the transportation costs and the environmental impacts of having people commute long distances. Um, we it's it's we've identified housing as a kind of a key economic driver for us in Fairfax as a as a as a need to be able to attract the workforce and to maintain the workforce that we have to have truly vibrant communities. So I'm going to pass it on now to Nina, who can talk more about truly the impact um, housing has um, on on people's lives and the types of folks that are are living in some of the affordable housing that we're talking about today. Great. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about three different households that live in APA properties, and they're not by any means uh, the universe of people who live in affordable housing, but just three examples. Uh, the first is a family, two parents and four children. Uh, the mother works at Northern Virginia Community College as a financial aid counselor, and dad works in construction. They were living in overcrowded apartments and moving year to year because of rent increases. At one point, they were sharing an apartment with two other families. So affordable housing allowed this household with middle income wages to stabilize their family, to find a right-sized apartment. They're in a three-bedroom APA property. Uh, and for the children to begin thriving in stable housing and stable schools. And they've been in this APA property for five years. Um, and I should say this is, uh, and I just mentioned this, the Arlington Mill property. So it's also next door to teen services. And it's a, they were on the waiting list along with 3,000 other people. So the mom often says this was her opportunity to win the lottery and change their lives. Second example I want to give is Pat. Pat is a senior citizen that came to the D.C. area decades ago, 1974, worked at a number of different jobs, but none of them had a pension. We know that you know some corporations and government service sometimes give you a pension opportunity, but she did not. So even though she had lived comfortably during all those years, she realized in 2004 when she retired, she didn't have the money to rent a market apartment in Arlington. This is the community she lived in for decades. So she moved into an APA apartment, and she was able to afford this based on Social Security and her savings. Now, my third example is a young person with a disability. And um, as you heard earlier, the um, Fairfax County HRA does a lot of housing for people with disabilities. Um, so does APA. About 10% of our units are dedicated to people with some kind of differing ability. Um, Zach is 30 and has a diagnosis of mild autism. His parents live nearby, but they wanted an opportunity for him to live independently. He makes a modest living working part-time at a computer recycling shop. He has a couple caregivers that come and support him, um, but he now has his own apartment, and it's very exciting for him and his family that he is able to move out of mom and dad's basement. 
So I will now um, pass this on to Vin. Those are, as I said, just three faces of people that live in affordable housing. Good morning. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what's been happening in Fairfax County over the last couple of years relative to affordable housing issue issues. Um, first of all, about four or five years ago, uh, the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors directed staff to develop uh, the county's first ever housing strategic plan. Um, and then in June 2018, the board adopted the first phase of that plan, uh, which is called the Community-Wide Housing Strategic Plan. And that first phase led to the creation of 25 short-term strategies that could be implemented in the next two years. So these are strategies that didn't require any additional resources from the board or additional staff that would need to be employed, but um, really kind of effective strategies that could be implemented right away without additional resources. The second phase of that plan was then adopted in 2019, which focused on the longer term strategies that would need to be developed to um, create additional resources to support production, preservation, and access to affordable housing. So again, the first phase was about kind of low hanging fruit that we could tackle right away, recognizing that additional resources would be needed. And so phase two was about how do we um, provide those resources to Fairfax County to allow for more affordable housing uh, development and, and uh, preservation. So the Board of Supervisors created a group of stakeholders to come up with recommendations around the resources. And that group uh, identified the additional number of housing units that would be needed over the next 15 years and also the funding sources and the mechanisms for developing uh, those units. And again, those recommendations were adopted by the Board of Supervisors. So there's really two big headlines with the strategic plan. One is about new production and resources. So the Board of Supervisors adopted a goal of producing at least 5,000 new affordable units over the next 15 years using public financial resources. So these are, these are gonna be new construction projects and so new housing throughout Fairfax County. And we believe we can get to at least 5,000 of those in the next 15 years. So this is a floor, it's not a ceiling. We believe that these public resources can be leveraged with other private and nonprofit investments to produce even more than 5,000, but we feel like at least with the public resources, we could get to 5,000. And this is really part of a broader regional effort around affordable housing. Affordable housing is, has always been a hot topic, but it's very hot right now around the whole region. Uh, the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments has adopted a goal for the entire region of which Fairfax County has been actively involved. So how do we get to the 5,000? Uh, the board and the county executive in his proposed budget included an additional cent on the real estate tax in addition to the current half penny that's allocated to affordable housing. So this, if it's adopted by the board supervisors, which we expect it will, uh, will result in about $24 million per year um, for the development of more affordable housing. There's also some other things involved there with transferring county land for affordable housing purposes and co-locating housing with other um, infrastructure. Um, and then finally, as part of the new production goal, um, the board recommended or directed that the deputy county executive also look at uh, land use policies, regulatory policies. As Nina will talk about a little bit later, it's not just the funding. The funding is critically important, but other tools need to be brought to bear in order to address this issue including land use and regulatory relief. And then the other big headline was about preservation of affordable housing units. Um, so in addition to units that are subsidized and have commitments on them, there's also many units out in Fairfax County that are just happen to be affordable, but there's no restrictions on those units. So they're privately owned units that happen to be affordable. So the board also uh, reaffirmed its commitment to a no net loss of all of, all of those units in Fairfax County. Um, and the way that they're planning on doing that is utilizing the current half penny to focus on preservation. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Nina to talk about um, why it's so hard to create affordable housing in Fairfax. Uh, absolutely, and uh, it is a confluence of factors. Certainly, it's a combination of rising rents and stagnant incomes that means Fairfax County housing market is increasingly out of reach for lower income people. Um, and this 
has a multiple impacts. We talked earlier about stability for housing, seniors, persons with disabilities, but also attracting and retaining businesses. So for example, um, these are the kinds of jobs that require often affordable housing to stay in the community. Increasingly, someone who's a retail salesperson earning an average of $29,552 a year cannot support themselves and live in market rate housing in Fairfax County. Um, all these other jobs too, graphic designer, security guard, medical writer, red purse, transcriptionist, Ooh, that's a hard one, um, an accountant, they too are finding themselves housing burdened, particularly if they're the sole wage earner in a family. Single parent households often are really struggling in this. So affordable housing as we define it, and it's defined by the federal um, Department of Housing and Urban Development, housing is affordable to people earning up to $85,000 for a family of four. Um, that's actually middle class in most communities. Here's some data about exactly what I was saying, that this has been changing over time. If you look at the last 20 years, we have data here from 1996 to 2016. Median income has increased over that time period, about 60%. However, median rent has increased uh, almost 100%, 96%. In other words, 150% faster than incomes. So this has been a really difficult time for households to stay in Fairfax. And this slide shows you exactly how that impacts households in terms of their sense of being cost burdened. So we define, um, the federal government defines a household as being extremely cost burdened. If they're spending over 50% of their income on rent, and guess what, in 2006, Fairfax County had almost 20,000 households that were extremely rent burdened. And over the last 10 years, that amount has increased 33% to almost 27,000. And interesting note that that is more than the total number of rent burdened households in these other three jurisdictions combined, Arlington, Alexandria, and Loudoun. In other words, this is, an, this is a significant challenge for people who live here. It's a growing challenge. And it's something that the entire metropolitan area has to deal with. No one jurisdiction is going to solve the problem, and no one jurisdiction is immune from it. Another question I'm often asked is, you know, who is the most rent burdened? And maybe this is intuitive, but um, I think it's helpful to see this data. And it's clearly the people who are the lowest wage earners. So people that are earning minimum wage, that are, again, seniors and persons with disabilities with very limited income, maybe living on Social Security, 77% of those households earning less than $20,000 a year are extremely rent burdened. Again, using that metric, spending more than 50% of their income on their housing. Um, fairly similar though, two thirds of the households between 20 and 35,000 a year are also extremely rent burdened. But it goes down dramatically as soon as people hit that fifty to $60,000 a year household income threshold. So when we look at policies on housing affordability, there are a lot of folks that are struggling with the increased costs. Maybe people in these higher incomes want to have a single family home. They can't afford it. They have to buy a townhome. They want to buy a townhome. They can only afford a condo. If they want a condo. They can only afford rental. But the ones who are really struggling in our community are the ones that can't afford any housing at all, people earning under 35000 a year. So that all sounds quite dire. And I think it's important to realize there are things we can do about it. Um, we have... I want to talk about three different resources, and actually there's a fourth one that's even not on this list, but just to throw it out here, which is rent subsidies. So there is a federal rent subsidy program, it's sometimes called Section 8, um, managed by the Fairfax County Department of Housing and Redevelopment, um, and there are sometimes local subsidy programs as well. But we need both reduced rents and more inventory. That's part of what the Metropolitan Washington COG, Council of Government study said, is we need more housing. So how do we produce more housing that's affordable? There's three basic tools, funding, land use tools, and regulatory tools. And I'll just jump into them in a little more detail on the coming slides. So the federal funding tool is probably the most appropriate and the most powerful. Um, under Ronald Reagan's administration in 1986, the federal government created the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Pretty obscure, kind of complicated concept, 
But what everyone here should know is that it's been the most powerful tool in creating affordable housing in the history of this country. It is really, it's created um, three million homes since 1987 that are dedicated to be affordable to lower income households. There is currently bipartisan legislation in Congress, of which Don Beyer, the representative from part of Fairfax, is a co-sponsor, to increase that by 150%. So there is some hope that that tool will even be expanded. And uh, we talked earlier, as I mentioned earlier, APA has a project that was one of the pioneers in creating hybrid financing that uses you don't necessarily need to understand all of this, but there's two different kinds of low-income housing tax credits. The 9% is more generous than the 4%. 4% tends to be underutilized. So the hybrid allows us to use more of the underutilized program, the 4%. Um, so I think we're doing a lot of things to use the federal resources, and we're hearing a little more conversation about it on the federal level. I actually heard it on a debate stage the other night. Um, so that's an important piece of the puzzle. Second piece of the puzzle is state resources. I'm very excited that in the last uh, 10 years, with Virginia, which was one of the states that had no housing trust fund, now does have a housing trust fund. It was funded at about seven and a half million the last few years. Um, again, thanks to another Northern Virginia legislature, um, Alfonso Lopez. Uh, Governor Northam and the General Assembly are in the final stages of negotiating the budget, and it looks like it'll be between 30 and 40 million for 21 and 22. So a new tool starting to realize the importance of housing on the state level. Municipal resources, and Ben talked earlier about the Fairfax County proposed budget, very important increase because in a high cost area like Fairfax, there's often a gap even with the low-income housing tax credit. So you often layer these tools together. So very exciting move um, that the um, county administrator has proposed, county executive has proposed. And I just want to note that many other municipalities are also stepping up their game. There's conversation in Arlington to increase their housing trust fund to 25 million. Alexandria imposed on themselves a meals tax last year, used all the revenue from that 1% meals tax to increase their Alexandria trust fund to 8 million, and DC devotes a significant amount of their general revenue, 138 million last year for their affordable housing trust fund. So important tools locally, especially in these high cost areas. Second bucket of tools I wanna to talk about is the land use tools. Basically, density is a form of monetizing land. If you can build one story on an on a acre of land and build 50 units, but you can build seven stories and 350 units, you've just created a resource that we can use and leverage for affordable housing. So um, APA is now in construction on a property called Queens Court in Roslyn neighborhood of Arlington. We took a 39-unit garden apartment complex is in the upper left of the screen, and we're building a 12-story, 249-unit property. That is um, you know, about an eight-fold increase from where we were, and very exciting. And the community really embraced it because it's a neighborhood with a lot of other high-rises. This is actually, though, going to be the tallest building within a one-block area. So it's, it's pretty cool that the neighborhood said, we understand the need for affordable housing, and we welcome that height as a way to address it. Um, public land for new or co-located housing is a really important tool. Um, I have two examples up here. Uh, one is, again, Arlington County. As I mentioned earlier, our Arlington Mill Project, co uh, co-location of affordable housing on top of a shared parking garage with a community center. Um, we're very excited about our first project in Fairfax, which will be the Oakwood Apartments, and I'll talk a little more about that in a couple slides. Um, but Fairfax is doing a lot more in this process and using the, um, it's called the a public private partnership to use public land as a way to create affordable housing. Um, another important tool is partnering with underutilized civic properties. And I'd say that the most common nationwide, and it really, some of it started here in Northern Virginia, is faith partnerships. Number of churches are looking at declining attendance large, out-of-date properties. They're spending a lot of their time thinking about the roof leak and how to repair their buildings and not focused on their mission. So they have identified partnering with affordable housing as a way to monetize their land, but also be mission-driven in their redevelopment. APA just completed uh, this in late 20, 
19, Gilliam Place, which was in partnership with the Arlington Presbyterian Church. We created 173 apartments on Columbia Pike, and the church has come back into a much smaller, accessible worship space on the first floor of that building. And that's the big image across the bottom of this slide. Um, another important piece of this, and I will talk more about Tuliger Place, which is partnering with an American Legion Hall. Similar to the faith communities, they had some issues with declining membership and an aging building. Um, another land use tool is the affordable housing bonus. So when the community says you must do affordable housing units on site, sometimes a developer will just incorporate that in a market building and that is a, a, a lovely compliment to the community. Sometimes there's a 200 unit property, it'll have five or 10 or 20 um, affordable units on site. site. Um, different municipalities have different regulations on that. D.C. has become very aggressive on that. Montgomery County also. In both communities, it's, it's trending towards 15% on site. Um, in parts of Northern Virginia, it's a little less than that and in Fairfax. But I do think it's both an option for on-site units or some creative uh, ways to pull out the land. So APA is working on a project in Loudoun. It's a 22-acre site. And the land developer pulled out three acres and sold it to APA and our partner at a discount so that we could do 100% affordable on part of that site. So the bonus density can have a lot of different executions, keeping it on site or creating a partial 100% affordable, or there's also a cash out option that can help fund the trust fund. Um, the regulatory tool. So there are a lot of fees involved with new construction of housing. So it is very important to use some of these tools, and often we see in our projects that we layer these tools. Loudoun County, for example, offers fee waivers for affordable projects. So the permit fees, the application fees. Many communities across the U.S. waive water and sewer tap fees, which can be quite expensive. Actually, that's one of the major tools California uses to support affordable housing is waiving their mitigation fees. Um, reduce or waive real estate taxes. DC waives real estate taxes for all affordable projects that have a nonprofit controlled sponsorship. Maryland offers a pilot payment in lieu of taxes for all rent restricted housing. So that actually is available for um, dedicated affordable housing or if a private owner says they want to dedicate their units to be affordable, they'll sign a contract often 20 years. That can be a very meaningful tool to create affordable housing and doesn't take that upfront cash. And there is legislation now in the Virginia General Assembly to talk about changing the Virginia Constitution because this has not been allowed in Virginia um, due to constitutional rules. So the home builders are co-sponsoring this. So I think it's kind of exciting to see a coalition of affordable housing advocates and home builders saying, this is a tool we should have in the Virginia toolbox. Um, expedited approvals. Again, the time and steps to do new construction housing can be quite onerous. So expediting the zoning process, expediting the um, permit process can give significant reductions in the cost of development. And I talked above a little bit about inclusionary zoning. So those on-site units that can either target low-income households directly at market properties or create incentives to create a set aside of land or cash. So again, three tools, funding, um, regulatory, and density, all of which often are combined to make a successful project. So I'm just going to close out with two um, more detailed examples. Oakwood Senior is a project that APA is developing on Van Dorn Street near the Beltway uh, on the border between Fairfax and the city of Alexandria. It is a six-acre site that currently functions as a stormwater pond kind of an undeveloped area that was uh, set aside for development of the Beltway, actually, and um, it wasn't needed, so Fairfax County gained control of that, and APA submitted a proposal under the, it's called PPEA, um, the acronym actually doesn't have a lot of meaning for this, but <laughs> Public Private Education Act, uh, but it means that Fairfax County can solicit uh, can collect unsolicited proposals and then put them out for competitive bid to make sure that they're getting a good value for this. APA put in the unsolicited proposal in February and was selected in December of 2018. Our proposal includes um, four stories of affordable housing on this six-acre site. 
um, surface parking that mostly will be towards Van Doren Street, uh, tree preservation along the backside. This site um, acts onto some single family homes, so we wanted to be respectful of their uh, privacy and their interests. We are going to create service rich resident programming. We know that when seniors moved into age restricted housing, sometimes they move in when they're on the younger end of seniors, sometimes they move in the older end. So we will work with the Office of Aging and other resources to make sure that we're providing the kind of resources these seniors need. We are only a mile from the metro station, and there's going to be some uh, work by the Department of Transportation to improve the pedestrian access to this site. And we are seeking, um, I talked earlier about multiple tools, so one of the tools is here, the density tool, we had to go through an entitlement process, the public land tool, using an underutilized piece of public land, and then we are applying for a big piece of this financing, which will be the low-income housing tax credit, hoping to get an allocation in 2020. That application goes in next week. We're a little nervous, it's competitive, but we're hoping to win. And uh, this also has some blueprint funding from the Housing Trust Fund. So you can see that we've got a whole series of tools that we've brought together to create this one larger property, um, which I think the neighbors have been very supportive in the Lee District. And I have to give a shout out also to the you know, former Lee District Supervisor, um, Jeff McKay, and the current Lee District Supervisor, Supervisor Rodney Luff, um, both of whom really encouraged us and supported us at every step of the way. So it takes citizen endorsement, it takes you know, political leadership, and it takes all these other tools to make these kind of projects happen. Now this last example I'm gonna cite for you is one that's using, again, a lot of these different tools. Um, we're hoping to close on this and start construction in April. Um, APA was selected by American Legion Post 139 in Arlington. Uh, again, a nonprofit organization that had an aging facility. They had a post that they had built in the 1950s. It was not accessible. Um, we know that 35% of veterans that leave service at leave service with some kind of um, disability. So literally you could not walk into their post because you had to go up or down a flight of stairs to get to the bar or the club room. So they felt like they had an out of date facility. They wanted to um, do something with a mission orientation in Arlington. They owned an acre and a half of land right up on a major quarter, Washington Boulevard in Arlington, two blocks from the Virginia Square Metro Station. But the entire neighborhood hadn't really been touched in 50 years. So we still had the infrastructure of an old neighborhood with two-story housing and commercial development. So this had to go through a two-step process in Arlington County to rezone the 1.3 acre site. That involved, again, getting all the neighbors engaged and embracing the concept of putting in a seven-story building where you had a two-story Legion post. And the Legion will, at the end of this process, end up with a brand new 6,000 square foot post. They will be right on Washington Boulevard. It'll be very urban, street oriented, walking distance to the metro. They're hoping to really invite more younger vets to come join. They've already seen an interest of younger vets expressing excitement about coming to this new facility. Um, it won't smell like a 1950s smoky, you know, inaccessible old building. Um, in this project, we layered so many tools. So again, the um, uh, hybrid 9%, 4% using the two tools of the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. We're getting VHDA, that's our State Housing Finance Authority, um, taxable and tax exempt bonds for the mortgage financing. Arlington County put money from their trust fund to make it happen. It has funding also from the Virginia Housing Trust Fund. And in this project, um, because we are dedicating half the units, we'll have a priority for veterans. Our board of directors felt that there was a potential interest in philanthropy, so we did a capital campaign. And Ron Terwilliger, who's a national leader in a housing affordability as well as um, former managing partner of Trammell Crow at the time when they were a big, the nation's biggest, the nation's biggest multifamily housing developer in the country, um, and he's quite a, a generous philanthropist, gave us a lead gift. Amazon also gave us a gift to our capital campaign. So we were able to layer all these different funding tools. We were able to use this rezoning to take a site that was only at the time that we signed a contract with the Legion, zoned for a two-story retail use to create seven-story multifamily residential use. And we will create 160 new affordable homes. 
50% with that veterans preference, will also become a hub for veterans programming, both on the housing side and in the Legion. So we're really honored to be part of that. And um, as some of our board members say, there's no easy projects left. Um, so the two projects in our communities often requires using multiple tools to make them happen. And that's the end of my input. Okay, um, so now we're going to talk a little bit just about the logistics for the event that's taking place on March 11th. So the housing challenge is designed to bring members of the community together to brainstorm solutions to critical housing challenges and teams will compete for cash prizes. Um, you know, Nina did an excellent job of talking about, you know, the different tools that can be used to develop more affordable housing, but it is a very complicated issue um, around the country, in particular in Fairfax County. So the one thing I just want to mention is, you know, you don't need to be a housing developer or a housing expert to participate in this challenge. We have come up with three specific challenges that we're looking for people to participate in. These come directly from the community-wide housing strategic plan. You can find out more information about each of them on the housing challenge website on fairfaxcounty.gov. I'm just going to spend a few minutes uh, kind of hitting the highlights on the three different um, challenges that, we're, that we have. The first one is around communications. So as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the Board of Supervisors has adopted a goal of 5,000 new affordable housing units in the next 15 years. So this challenge is about how do we come up with a communication strategy to build broad support for that goal. As you may be aware of, there is a lot of community opposition to affordable housing. Nina described how you need um, citizen endorsement and um, public official um, buy-in. In many cases, you know, when a project's about to be delivered in a certain location, we do see opposition to those projects. So how do we reach a diverse audience within Fairfax County to get the um, support for the 5K by 15? And how can messages be tailored to different audiences to build that support? So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is about partnerships, how we engage employers and non-traditional partners in providing affordable housing. So this challenge will be about developing a set of policies that will result in commitments from employers to support the issues that we have here. Again, we've had a lot of success with private and nonprofit developers with affordable housing in Fairfax County, but not as much with employers, particularly large employers. So this will be about, you know, how do we find out what other jurisdictions have done with employers to get them to support this issue? Um, what are the barriers in Fairfax County and how can we actually get um, real commitments from employers to come to the table on this issue? And then lastly is about faith communities. Again, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, the cost of land in Fairfax County is really the biggest obstacle to developing new affordable housing. So um, houses of worship do often have underutilized land that could be repurposed for affordable housing, but it can be very difficult for them to get started and see it through for a number of different reasons. Um, so what we're looking for on this one is a policy strategy to provide the technical assistance that houses of worship would, be, would need that are interested in developing housing on their land. So again, many, you know, providing affordable housing to low-income populations might be part of the mission of a house of worship, but how do they kind of take that next step to actually moving forward on um, developing a new project? So again, those are the three challenges. Please look at the Housing Challenge website for more information about all three of those. Hi, everybody. Um, so we'll talk a few minutes now on some specific logistics um, for the challenge day, day itself. And folks, as, as we're talking, please go ahead and um, start typing in any questions you might have, um, either on the material presented by Vin and Nina or any specific questions that you have about the logistics um, for the challenge. Um, but some quick highlights of what our plan is for the day, you know, the, what we're envisioning is having some teams pull together and brainstorm and come up with solutions to the three challenges that Vin just uh, provided an overview on. You know, we, it's possible that there could be teams that will, provide, will be interested in providing multiple entries, but um, only one cash prize will be awarded for each team. 
Um, and just as a reminder, um, first prize is um, $1,500, second place is $1,000, and third place is $750, and there will be free food and drinks as well there to keep you guys sustained during the competition. Um, so there will be a need to provide a tax form, a tax release form, um, before leaving the event. Uh, so that, that we, and if you have any questions about it, please let us know. Um, the, the, the teams will be presenting to a panel of judges, um, and uh, so some of the basic, the, the criteria for the, what the judges are looking for. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. I mean, primarily one is is the policy is your solution specific to the policy questions that we that we um, presented, you know, the three challenge questions. Though if you have an amazing idea about something completely different that's a, that's that's about affordable housing, um, we are we are open to it. You know, we just kind of get a little extra points if you're specific to the policy questions. But if you have something that's a little bit different, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> we are also giving points to whether you're kind of identifying non traditional partners our new partner organizations um, and uh, incorporating diverse perspectives in your solution. We're also uh, giving points for unique uh, considerations specific to Fairfax County that, uh, that are most applicable that Fairfax can implement right away, um, creative solutions that are faster, cheaper, and that really is considering the changing economic and demographic landscape of Fairfax. And uh, of course, the biggest point is if it's comprehensive and really feasible to implement. We are really, um, really interested in, in getting some ideas out of here that are potential, that do have the potential to be applied, um, that are scalable and um, that are adoptable. Our goal is to share these ideas with um, Fairfax County, um, our, our board of supervisors, public officials, uh, our boards, authorities, and commissions, um, our, and our staff. Um, we're, we're hoping to get some creative ideas out that we can actually and in addition to the cash prize, you do will have the glory of being able to of presenting to these different groups as well. Um, we ask that you everyone bring um, one laptop per team. If this is a hardship, we ask that you do contact us and let us know, and we can make laptops available. But we do ask, it, you know, please don't forget it. If you have one at home, please do bring it because we are asking the presentation to be made in a PowerPoint format. Um, so if you um, are coming as an individual or a team, there will be time to network and for, for folks to form a team. You know, we, 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 Fairfax has had a couple of hackathons in the past and um, that were primarily around data. And this is the first time we're doing one that's around policy. But um, in our last hackathon, which was around housing data solutions, we did the team that won were, were folks that were complete strangers that showed up that day, didn't know each other, so if you um, if you are concerned about that, um, well, there there will be an opportunity to form teams during that day. Um, we do ask the teams to have a minimum of four people so for 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 the competition. Um, and uh, again, there's additional all this information is available on our website, and um, there's a link available here um, to the website. Um, all right, uh, next slide. Um, so we registration will begin at 8:30 on the day of the event, on, um, and the kickoff will be at 9. There is uh, parking information available at the website, but the uh, Rappahannock parking deck at George Mason University, and there is public transportation available, and here's the bus information here on the website as well. So um, now we'll leave it to some time for folks if anybody has any um, questions on either the material presented specific to the Housing 101 um, or, uh, or questions around the event. Okay, so we do have a couple questions that have come in. Let me go to the top. Oh, you want to read off the first one? So the first one is, <clears throat> the question is, I'm interested in visualizing data about housing needs, et cetera, who to contact about helping with that. You can contact Linda Hoffman with the Department of Housing and Community Development. Her email address is lynda.hoffman, H-O-F-F-M-A-N, at fairfaxcounty.gov. And we do have materials available on the website. 
either through the, the, 20, that, the Fairfax County 2020 Housing Challenge website and also the link is available through the invitation. Um, and there we do have a bunch of material in there around housing policies and demographic data about Fairfax. Okay, the next question is, what supplies do we need to bring with us? Sketch paper, pens, et cetera. And what format will we be presenting our solutions? I'm gonna ask Etta to handle that one. We, um, so we do ask that you bring a laptop and we do ask that it's be in a PowerPoint presentation. Um, we, we'll, we'll have supplies like pen, paper, we'll have um, like uh, <clears throat> the butcher block paper that you can put on the walls for brainstorming. Um, and but we do are we are asking that uh, people bring a memory stick, or 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 you can email the presentation to us there on that day. Does that help? Hopefully that answers your question. And there will be, like I said, there will be lunch and snacks and things like that available too. Red Bull if we can pull it off. I don't know <laughs> if we can. <laughs> okay, next question. I noticed a mention of a pushback from residents, specifically HOAs, who usually take on the negative of NIMBYism. I've always thought that we do a poor job of informing residents on why this housing issue is so important, rather than waiting for them to organize against and then not being able to handle the fallout. Any ideas going forward? Uh, I mean, this is a great question. I think this kind of ties directly into the first challenge about communication. You know, how do we build that widespread community support, recognizing that there will always be people who oppose this issue? You know, working with the folks who use the affordable housing is one part of that. There are also different parties that, other parties that we want to make sure get involved. But I think I would just kind of flip this back to the group. I mean, this is what we're looking for people to come up with who address this particular challenge. You know, how do we get into those populations that we have difficulty reaching and getting them to come to support the projects when we're actually at the point of um, moving forward on a project? And I'll jump in, I'll add that that question is so on the nose of exactly why we're even <clears throat> doing the challenge in the first place. We're hoping that we can get some HOAs to come to attend the event and be part of the solution and to come early on. And we're hoping that this 101 can be a resource for them as well. So it, um, please do reach out to your network and see if we can get some some of those folks to really kind of come and participate and be part of the solution process. Okay, another another question for units focused on affordable workforce housing. How are potential applicants vetted to ensure that the housing is provided to members of the local workforce? Uh, well, I, I assume that's talking about you know, ADU units that are, you know, delivered in with private market developers. And so the owners of those units are required to make sure that eligible households are coming in to those units and the Department of Housing and Community Development monitors that to make sure that it's actually happening. Um, but if you reach out to me directly, I can give you more information about that. My email address is Vincent, V-I-N-C-E-N-T dot Rogers, R-O-G-E-R-S at fairfaxcounty.gov. Well, and I'm happy to weigh in on this a little, too. I, if the question is, you know, how do you know you're serving local people, the answer is twofold. One is um, all of the affordable housing finance usually requires you to do affirmative marketing to reach out to the local Section 8. I mentioned Section 8, the, the voucher program waiting list to wit to reach out through public channels to make sure those units are widely advertised and sometimes affirmatively advertised for people with disabilities. If, for example, the project I talked about is targeting vets, so we're going to do affirmative marketing through vets. Um, and the second piece is that we have found anecdotally that the people who tend to apply for housing are people that live locally. So, for example, in our Arlington project, 75% of the people that move into our new projects actually live in Arlington. Another 25% might come from out of the area or they're returning to Arlington. So it, it, you do get a mix of people, but I do think that the, the regulatory uh, impact of affirmative marketing and just the way that people move, you're, you're not going to get people moving here from Hawaii or Florida. Okay, next question. Are the winning solutions to the earlier housing data challenge publicly available? Yes. Yes, I, I do believe we do have them. On the Fairfax County website, we we have had their presentations on the website, and 
Um, you know what, it's actually probably been a pretty good idea to provide a link on the 2020 Housing Challenge website to that as well. So th the questions addressed in that challenge were different than what we have here. And those presentations were around data solutions or website or app, which is different than these policy questions we're addressing. But I think that that would be, yeah, yeah that would be fun. And yeah, we'll put that on there. Okay, next question. Will there be name tags and the possibility of us writing strengths on them? How will we be able to organize by interest, et cetera? Um, <clears throat> I think what we're planning on doing is during the teaming time, we'd have different areas of the room that are kind of focused on the different challenges. So if you come into the room and you're interested in a particular challenge and looking to find a team that you'd be able to find that fairly easily. Um, other than that, we don't want to get too prescriptive about how people um, kind of communicate with each other, but we wouldn't have any uh, problem with you putting something on your name tag if you kind of wanted to use that to identify some strengths that you have. I think we will have name tags. Yeah, we will have name tags. And that's a great, that's a great invention there. That's a good idea. Like, you know, yeah. to put your, to have your name, maybe even have a second name tag with your strengths mm -hmm. underneath there for folks to walk around and, uh, and but what we've done in the past is we've done like some kind of like a speed dating thing where people have gone up and quickly told about the, the state, the problem thing that they would like to address, maybe a little bit about the, what they'd like to work on, what, what they're looking for. You know, I'm looking for someone who's a whiz with PowerPoint and marketing to help me develop my, my presentation. Um, so uh, we're, we're thinking we would do something similar this time as well. Okay, last call for any more questions. Okay. Yeah. Yep, that one. Oh, we have one. Oh, yeah, one. So um, the question is, are you reaching out to big county employers, especially new ones, for their commitments to affordable housing? I can speak for Fairfax County. The answer to that is not successfully. You know, we've we've attempted to, but just haven't been able to get in the door with a lot of the big employers for a variety of different reasons. But again, and this kind of goes back to that one challenge with the employers that we'd be looking for people to help us with. How can we better um, sort of incentivize employers or get them to understand this issue in a different way so that we could get them more engaged in you know, development of new housing or preserving what we already have. I have a question. Okay. I have a question here. Um, where is the county in terms of meeting the 5K by 15 goal? Okay. So um, the question is, where's the county on meeting the 5K by 15 goal? So the Board of Supervisors included this in their budget guidance for this upcoming fiscal year and the county executive put it into his proposed budget. So assuming that the Board of Supervisors adopts that portion of the budget, which is an additional penny on the real estate tax to go towards development of affordable housing, that will really kind of start the clock on the 5K by 15. Having said that, we haven't been sort of resting on our laurels with that. We have been producing as best we can. And if you go to um, one of our websites, it's called eFordable, e hyphen F F O R D A B L E dot org. You can see some tools that we have for tracking where we are on um, the overall goal of 5K by 15. I, I have one more question here. Um, in Nina's presentation, she talked about the um, housing trust funds in Arlington. I think she said about 25 million, and DC had 158 million. What's in, how much does Fairfax, how much is Fairfax County's housing trust fund? It's a lot lower than those. Yeah. <laughs> but it's proposed to go higher. Yeah. But it's proposed to go. It's higher. proposed to go higher. Yeah. For the most part, it hasn't really been enough to kind of move projects further than they already are. But if the board moves forward with this penny, <clears throat> penny in the real estate tax, it should result in an additional twenty-four million dollars per year to go into that, you know, quote-unquote trust fund. Can I jump in on here? Sure. Hello? Yes. Oh, can you hear us? I, I can hear you all. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so this 5,000 um, 
units, that's a low ball. Uh, we're pushing for that, uh, but here's here's what we need to have to have, have to happen. We live in Northern Virginia, which by far is probably more expensive to live than Dinwiddie County and all of our suburban areas. So that support on getting those funds to come from a state level needs to be um, sort of, how can I say this? We need to have voices at these, uh, um, at the General Assembly to really root for that, that power, that dollar, you know, um, and we need you all support. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. Ben knows me. Uh, uh, I don't know about Karen, but uh, um, <clears throat> quite a few people know me that I've been supporting affordable housing for a long time. So we're actually going to some of the delegates, some of the senators, some of the people who actually will make those rules and demand those dollars be generated towards Fairfax County. And one time we used to be the richest county in, in, in America. We're probably number two or maybe slipping down to number three. But look at what Loudoun County is doing now. We lost a big part of that by giving some of the proffers to Amazon to get them in here. But now that they're here, let's not look back and say negatively, let's move forward and try to generate. You know, Reston area has a lot of, of talent there. There's a lot of workforce places there. What we need is a buy-in from all the residents. The residents really need to know why this is so important. Um, the workforce housing, the teachers, the firefighters, the school. You know, when people think of affordable housing, the first thing that comes to mind is Section 8. There is a whole gamut of people who are not even in that realm, but they just can't afford to live here. So what they're doing is they're moving to Loudoun County, they're moving to Prince William County, and blah, 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 but they're working in the county, okay? so. We need a buy-in from everybody here, and I'm hoping that you all will turn out en masse, not just for this event, but going forward. We need to lift up awareness for everybody in this county. I believe in this county. I've lived here a lot of my life, um, but we need a buy-in. So I'm, I'm glad to have this going on. This is a great idea, the challenge, you know, to, to, to see what, what people can put forth. You all have some great minds out here, so let's utilize that and try to get this thing going forward. I, I just want to get my two cents in. Okay. Thanks, Ken, for that plug. We really appreciate that. And, you know, I think a lot of what you're talking about would go into all three of these st strategies, but particularly or challenges, particularly the one about communication. So we look forward to seeing what people can produce as part of that challenge and the other two. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I think those are some some really good points and, and it's and it's exactly right you know you've got workers that are working in Fairfax commuting from Loudoun and Prince William it's um, not ideal for um, any number of reasons um, so thank you okay I think that's the end of the questions I think that's all of the questions that we've received so um, thank you all so much for joining us if there's anything that you think of afterwards please send an email we have Linda's uh, Linda Hoffman's email on the website uh, and uh, so please let us know if you've got any questions um, either on the material if you have any questions of the material that we have on the website if there is some materials that um, that you know of that you think would be helpful for others participating in the challenge please let us know and we will put them on the website um, if there's some interesting research reports data um, that are publicly available, um, we will put it on the website. We do ask that any information that's used for the challenges be publicly available, so it's an like even playing field. If you have any materials <clears throat> that are proprietary, we do ask that you let us know ahead of time so we can share it with others so everyone can participate on the same level. So um, thank you so much for joining us, and we are so excited to see you guys on March 11th. Please share the word if there's others who you think might be interested in participating to, to register. It's not too late. We're, we're looking forward to having broad participation in the event.